Good morning, Calvary. I, uh, what you just saw is just an incredible reminder of just the wonderful ministry that we get to have right here in our church with our deaf ministry. And so I want to ask us all to just let our uh, friends here know how much we appreciate them by giving them a round of applause. But hold up like this. And we're so glad that you guys are part of our community. And Miss Vicki, thank you so much um, for who you are and what you bring to our church. Uh, that was a video done by a college student as part of a senior project. And so, I mean, just, I can't think of a better ministry of our church to be highlighted in such a way. But I wanna ask you, if you're here, uh, I, would you join uh, me in praying with Christians from all over the world uh, today as we pray the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you have a copy of the scriptures, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to continue our study uh, of the parables of Jesus uh, as told in the gospel of Matthew. And while you're turning there, I'll tell you a little story about when I was in middle school. Um, when I was, you know, 11, 12 years old, I was really into collecting baseball cards. So anybody with me, 90s kids, baseball card collecting. And, uh, you know, my buddies, we'd get at the lunch table in the cafeteria and we'd start, you know, we'd pull out of our cargo pants, you know, all our baseball cards. And it was like, hey, what well, you got? I got this, I got this, I got this. And uh, I mean, this was kind of normal thing to do during lunch as a kid in the 90s. And I remember one particular day, one of my buddies pulled out a card that I thought was so cool. I mean, it just absolutely blew me away. It was, uh, uh, it was a 1996 Cal Ripken Jr. card, but it wasn't a typical baseball card. Most typical baseball cards, it's like action shot, batting stance, fielding, whatever, and then like some stats laid over the top of it. You know, what position they play, all that sort of stuff. But this was unlike those cards. This was a picture of Cal Ripken Jr., but it looked like an Etch-A-Sketch drawing. And I saw this baseball card for the first time on the lunch table and I was like, I gotta have it. I've got to have this baseball card. And so I said to my buddy, I said, hey, what do you want for it? He's like, man, I ain't giving this thing up. This thing's amazing. I was like, what? I got Juan Gonzalez. I got Greg Maddox. I got Albert Bell. I got Barry Larkin. He's like, I don't want any of those. I said, do you want all of them? I'll give you everything I have for that card. And he said, no, not interested. I said, all right, man, you drive a hard bargain. Who's your favorite baseball player? And this is what he told me. Remember, this is 1996. So some of you, if you know, you know. He said, Jay Buhner. And uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, so I went home that day and I said, all right, I got to find every Jay Buhner I've got. And so I emptied the box on my bedroom floor and there was all these baseball cards spread across the floor. And I picked out, I found every Jay Buhner card I could find. And it was probably about 30, 40, 50 of them. I don't remember, it was a lot. And so I remember calling my buddy, you know, excuse me, miss, you know, whatever, can I speak to, you know, I said, hey, bring the Cal Ripken Jr. card. I got I got a trade for you. We show up the next day and I bring a plastic bag full of Jay Buners. And I said, I want your Cal Ripken. And he said, you got it. And we made a trade. Now, do you see it? The kingdom of heaven is like a Cal Ripken Jr. baseball card. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear, Okay. <laughs> Today, that Cal Ripken Jr. card of mine, I still have it. It's at my parents' house. It sells for a whopping $8.80. But fortunately for me, that is $8.79 more than all the J. Buhner cards combined. So we could. <laughs> but my point is this. As a 12-year-old boy, I was willing to give up whatever I had to to gain the thing that I wanted more than anything. You see, the value that you place on something is demonstrated by what you will gladly give up in order to gain it. In our text today, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus continues telling parables about the kingdom of heaven, and he offers two short parables that teach this lesson, but on a much deeper level. He says this, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has 
and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who, on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus says here, he says the kingdom of heaven, he says like this, it's like a poor man walking in a field who stumbles upon something. Now, surprise, now um, surprisingly, this was actually not uncommon in Jesus's day to stumble upon a treasure. So I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I got a metal detector. I saved up my allowance, bought a metal detector from Radio Shack and was convinced that I was going to find a treasure in my backyard. Never found it, you know, because there's no buried treasures in North Alabama where I grew up. Um, but in Jesus's day and in his place, um, to find buried treasure was not, actually not that uncommon because people didn't have access to banks like we do today. And so what would happen is people, in order to, to keep their money, their fortunes safe, they would bury them on their property. And often what would happen is when they died, the knowledge of the location of the money would die with them. And so there would be people with property with treasures on it they didn't even know. And even today, uh, archeologists to still today continue to uncover personal treasures throughout Galilee and throughout the region. And so this man in this parable, he stumbles upon this hidden treasure and he immediately becomes just overwhelmed with immense joy. He's never seen anything like this before. He's never stumbled upon anything like this before. And in his mind, he says, I've got to have this. I've got to have it no matter what it costs. And so what he does is he reburies the treasure. I mean, he could have stolen it, but he said, you know what? I don't want to risk losing it by getting convicted. So he buries it and he goes home. He liquidates everything he owns, everything that he has, and he goes and he buys the plot of land. And we know that this man in the parable is likely a poor man because it takes everything he owns to buy one little plot of land. But he makes this deal not with obligation, not with trepid, but with joy. But then Jesus says, he gives another parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven is also like this. It's like a businessman, a wealthy merchant who is, quote, in search of fine pearls. And, you know, pearls were to that society what diamonds are to ours. They were the most valuable thing you could comprehend. And this man in the second parable, he doesn't stumble upon the treasure. He was seeking it out. He was a, a collector of fine pearls. And so he knew exactly what he was looking for, and he knew exactly when he found it. And for this man, I mean, this was, a, uh, this was worth a tremendous amount. And he was willing to let go of his entire pearl collection in order to gain this one pearl. And not only his pearl collection, but all of his wealth. And this was, this, not only was this costly, this is probably a, seemingly a wealthy man, but not only was this costly to, to sell everything he had, but it would have took him, taken a lot of work. I mean, if you were to walk out today and you were to say, hey, look, I'm going to liquidate all my wealth. I mean, it's not just like a simple thing to do. I mean, it takes a lot of effort to sort of gather all your assets and, and liquidate them. And so he does all this work, but the scriptures say he does it with joy. Now, um, many of you, you may not know Pastor Joey, but our kids pastor, um, he has what I consider to be the most impressive bobblehead collection I've ever seen. And so if you were to go in his office, his bookshelves are lined not with books, but with bobbleheads, hundreds of them, right? And I don't know what it would take for Joey to sell his entire bobblehead collection, but for this man, he was willing to let go of his entire pearl collection for just one pearl. And he did it with joy. And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And you know, the point of these parables, they're actually very simple. Um, it's easy to understand what Jesus is saying. Uh, these aren't mysterious stories that Jesus is telling. For both of these men, it seems obvious. Everything in their life changes the moment they discover this incredible treasure. And they gladly reorient everything in their lives in order to gain the one thing they desire most. And the lesson here is this, the kingdom of God is so great, it's so valuable that it is worth any and every sacrifice in order to gain it. See, this parable, it doesn't teach that God is worth more than anything else. It teaches that God is worth more than everything else. See, like I said, the meaning of this parable, it's easy to understand. But we all know that there's a difference between understanding something and really understanding something. There's a difference between knowing something and knowing something. So you may know that honey is sweet, but if you've never tasted honey, you never know exactly what that means. You know, I could tell my friends and family, 
I could tell my friends and family that are from out of town, I could say, hey guys, you need to understand, dreamland ribs are delicious, right? And they could hear me describe the ribs. They could go online and read articles about dreamland ribs. They could get on YouTube and watch uh, videos of dreamland ribs. And they could uh, go read Yelp reviews, five-star Yelp reviews about dreamland ribs. But until they've come to Tuscaloosa and entered that old shack and tasted those ribs, they'll never really know. See, you can understand something, know something in theory, but not know it. This fall, I've got some good buddies of mine from the Northeast, from New York. Um, they want to come down and watch an SEC football game. And one of the guys went to Temple University, so he don't know nothing about college football. But they say, hey, I want to come and I want to experience SEC football. They say, I've heard that it just means more down there, right? And see, they've watched the games on television. They've seen the games. They've seen footage of the tailgates. They've heard stories of rabid, crazy fans. But they don't know yet. They live in Big Ten country. They just don't know. But if they're able to come down this fall and experience an Alabama game, they're going to know. They're going to know. See, if they experience it, they'll really know. And see, Jesus' parables are kind of like this. Jesus' parables are meant to provoke us. This is why he says, anyone who has ears to hear, hear. Um, Eugene Peterson translates it this way. He says, are you listening? Are you really listening? See, what Jesus is saying to us is he's saying, you may understand the Bible. Uh, You may know all the stories. You may know all the interpretations. You may understand all the creeds of Christianity. You may even, you may understand the logic of the gospel of Jesus. You may have a theology degree or a seminary degree, but Jesus is saying, put all that aside. Do you know it? Have you experienced it? Have you tasted it for yourself? And this is the question that Jesus is provoking us to consider in this parable. Jesus says through these two parables, he says, the way that we know, the way that we really know that we understand the kingdom of God is this, joy and sacrifice. So the first thing I want you to see this morning is this, the kingdom of God offers surpassing joy. Jesus says of the poor man, he says, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And I think in my understanding of this passage, the three most important, the most critical words in this entire uh, set of parables here is this, in his joy, in his joy. See, I remember when I was a little middle school kid, I remember coming home from school that day with that Cal Ripken Jr. card. And I remember the first thing I did when I got home is I put that card, you remember those little acrylic baseball card sleeves? The first thing I did was slipped it in one of those sleeves to protect it. And I stuck it on my nightstand. And I remember just sitting in my bed, taking that card out and just looking at it, looking at it in different light, flipping it over, reading the stats, memorizing how many games in a row Cal Ripken Jr. had played, memorizing his batting averages, just beholding that card. It was the coolest thing in the world to my little middle school brain. Even to this day, it's still, I know exactly what drawer it's sitting in at my parents' house. I go look at it. Anytime. And I just remember just beholding that card. And I never once thought again about what I had given up in order to gain it. Never once was I going, man, I wish I had all those Jay Buhner cards. I simply cherished what it was that I had gained. That card was a joy to me. And I think, you know, many people, when they think of Christianity, when they think of following Jesus, I think many people don't see it as a joy. I think many of us, if we're honest, we would say, well, the kingdom of God feels a lot to me like a to-do list or a set of rules. If I do these things, God will give me eternal life in heaven. He might bless me, but I'm not going to be happy about having to do all these things that he asked me to do. You see, many of us, we view Christianity as a trade-off. I'll obey the rules. I'll check the boxes. I'll stay between the lines if that means I can keep God happy with me. And for, that, for, for those of us that, that have this mindset, the kingdom of God becomes an obligation and not a joy. And Jesus has never said that the kingdom of God is an obligation. It's a joy. Years ago, I heard it explained to me the difference between Australian cattle ranching and American cattle ranching. Okay, so if you own a lot of cattle, I don't know if that's you in this room, you're going to want to protect your investment, Right? You're going to want to keep the cattle on your property. You don't want them wandering off. You don't want them on other, any, someone else's land. So what do we do? In America, we build fences. 
Large fences to keep things out and keep things from coming, going in or coming out. We, want, we build fences to keep cattle inside of our property lines. We've got these clear boundaries. We have structures that can't be crossed. But you know, in the Australian outback, the landscape is so vast that you, uh, building a fence around the perimeter is, I mean, it's, it's impractical. And not only that, the weather can be so unforgiving that what you really need to keep your cattle around is not a fence, but a well. See, in the unforgiving climate of the outback, if you have a clean water source, a refreshing water source, your cattle will never want to leave. They'll never leave the property because they'll never stray far from the water source. They'll joyfully stay on the property because they know where life is found. And I think many of us, we view Christianity as a fence. We view it as a set of rules that are meant to keep us in line. But Jesus says, no, 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 the kingdom of God is like a well. Jeremiah 2, verse 13, God says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jesus told the woman at the well, he said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus says, I am the living water. Revelation 7, 17, a picture into eternity. Jesus said, God says, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. See, the kingdom of God is not a fenced in perimeter to keep you in line. It is a wellspring of water that gives you life and keeps you coming back for more. And if you go out and try to find life from any other source, you will remain thirsty. That's why the men in these parables, they gladly gave everything they had because they knew what they were gaining. I heard one teacher say it like this. They said, you know, when we think of counting the cost of discipleship, many of us, we imagine some anxious guy in a back room with a green visor and, a, and biting his nails and a calculator going, I, I, is, it, uh, is it worth the cost? They're crunching the numbers. Is it worth it? Is following Jesus worth it? If I give up this, will I gain this? And you see, the picture of these two men in this parable is nothing like that. The only thing that these two men in these parables are sweating is whether or not their deal would get accepted. They were happy to give everything. They weren't, there, there was no bargaining here. They said, we'll give you everything. They were just hoping that it would be accepted. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So let me ask you, what do you feel when you think of Jesus? How do you feel when you think of Jesus? Have you discovered him to be a treasure to you? Who is Jesus to you? Because here's who he is. He created you. He paid the price for your sin. He took your place on the cross. He has removed all your sin and your shame and your guilt. And he defeated death so that you don't have to walk through those doors. He sent his spirit into your life calling uh, to give you comfort and peace and purpose and calling. He's promised that he is in heaven right now preparing a place for those who receive his grace. He's promised that he will return again. And when he returns again, he'll remove all evil from the world. And not only will he remove evil from the world, he'll remove it from within you. You know, all those parts of your own soul that you just hate, those temptations you wish would go away, all those thoughts you wish you didn't have. Jesus says that when he comes, he will take your heart of stone and he will, he will replace it with a beating heart of flesh. He has promised that he will make you new. He has promised that he will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He has promised that he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And he has said that in the kingdom of heaven, there will be no need for the sun or the moon because his glory is enough to light up all of creation. And you can behold his glory, but you must first see him as a treasure. You see, your heart can't be divided. You can't see Jesus as the ultimate treasure and still hold on to other things. We've been singing, you know, often at Calvary, we sing this song, The Goodness of God. And I was speaking with uh, someone in our church this week who's in the hospital, has just been dealing with a frustrating string of health issues over the last several months. And 
This person said to me, you know, I've been clinging to that song, The Goodness of God, that line where it says, all my life you've been so faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And this person said, I'm just, I'm singing this in my head over and over. And you know, in that part, there's a part in the song where it says, with my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you, Jesus, everything. Why? Because your goodness has already come running after me. You see, Jesus is our treasure because he first viewed us as his treasure. See, it's not, not only do these men in the parable go looking for treasure, but Jesus went looking for a lost treasure as well. And the scriptures say, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus gave all that he had to buy you back as his treasure. The scriptures say you are bought with a price, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Second Corinthians 8, 9 says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. See, this is the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. This is who Jesus is. And let me ask you, does that give you joy? Or does it make you yawn? See, the kingdom of God offers surpassing joy if you will take hold of it. The kingdom of God offers surpassing joy, but the kingdom of God also makes demands. The kingdom of God demands sacrifice. Man, I've been so just thrilled over the last several weeks as we've seen all these baptisms happening in our church. Just uh, tons and, I mean, just so many people saying, uh, just lives changed. And you know, when we baptize, we ask two questions here. Do you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save you? They say, I do. And the second question is, will you go wherever he calls you to go and do whatever he asks you to do? And some people take issue with this. They say, oh, those, that seems intense. That seems too serious. Go wherever he calls you to go. Do whatever he asks you to do. But you see, this is the nature of following Jesus. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save you? I mean, if the answer to that question is no, then you're probably not, you shouldn't be in the baptism waters to begin with. So the first question is, do you believe everything? Do you believe Jesus has done everything necessary to save you? Yes, yes, I do. Well, if you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save you, then the only logical response to the second question, will you go wherever he calls you to go and do whatever he asks you to do? The only logical response is absolutely. Absolutely. I think of the the great hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. There's this line in that song. It says, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Listen, when you get married... The vow you make to your spouse is this. I will forsake all others, keeping myself only for you as long as we both shall live. Now, it would be crazy if somebody objected to that and said, whoa, 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 that seems too intense. That seems too restrictive, right? And if you've ever, I mean, I I remember on my wedding day when the back doors of that church swung open wide and I saw Rebecca dressed in white and she's walking down that aisle. Listen, I wasn't thinking of all the other women I had dated in my life in that moment. And I wasn't thinking even of all the possible women I I was potentially forsaking by taking her as my wife. In that moment, I was so consumed with joy that I was gladly willing to lay down all other options in that moment and forever for the remainder of my life. Why? Because I wanted whatever it took and I was willing to make whatever sacrifice and commitment it took to attain Rebecca Scoggins as my wife. That's the requirement for marriage, that you forsake all others. And nobody's going, oh, that seems intense or restrictive. Why do we do this with the kingdom of God? See, this is what it means to come to God. To attain the kingdom of heaven, we must lay our lives down our sinful ambitions. And we must say, Lord, everything is yours. Jesus says, this is the only way. We can get get anxious about losing certain things. We can get anxious about where God might be leading us. But Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and all the other things, what you'll eat, what you'll wear, where you'll end up, all those things will be added to you. Peter Kraft, the Christian philosopher says, if we come to God with empty hands, he will fill them. But if we come to God with full hands, he has no place to put himself. So how do you attain the kingdom of heaven? How do you become a Christian? How do you capture the treasure? The scriptures say we repent. But what is repentance? See, many people, 
when you hear repentance, we, we get an image in our head of somebody screaming at us. But listen, you got to understand when Jesus says repent, he's not on a soapbox yelling at you. Jesus, when he says repent, he's inviting you into something. See, to repent is to turn from the direction that you're going and walk in a new direction. Repentance is to say, Lord, the way I'm walking is not giving me the treasure that I long for, but I believe that treasure is found where you lead. And I'm willing to turn this from this going this direction and walk in the direction that you're leading. The apostle Peter says in Acts chapter three, in Acts chapter three, verse 19, he says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. See, repentance is not an ugly word. Repentance is not a scary word. It's something we do with joy because we know that there's treasure on the other side of it. You've, you may have heard the name before of Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a Christian missionary who knowingly went into a part of the world where he knew he would likely be killed. And he was. He was speared to death. His story has been told in movies and in multiple books. And what he's most famous for is after he was killed, his journal was recovered. And in it, he had written these words. Now, this quote often gets attributed to him, but he actually was quoting Matthew Henry, but he said these words. This is a man who died as a missionary in a foreign land, taking the gospel to these people. And Jim Elliott says this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'll say that again. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. See, it is not foolish at all to spend everything for the glory of Jesus. It's not foolish at all. Because what you gain can never be lost. See, the kingdom of heaven, church, is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the wisdom of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for these parables that provoke us. God, they're like grenades that land on our hearts. And God, they disrupt our preconceived notions and our thoughts. But Lord, I pray that we have ears to hear today. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see that you are the ultimate treasure. And God, that whatever it takes to attain the life you're calling us to, Lord, it's worth every sacrifice. God, I pray for those in this, in this room who are like me, who are so easily distracted by things that, that shine like fool's gold. God, so easily distracted by things that don't give life, that we lose sight of you, the ultimate treasure that brings everlasting joy. So God, would you give us the eyes to see and the courage to obey, to, to hear the words of this parable. And Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand? We're going to sing a song of response. <clears throat> and I want to invite you, if the Spirit is speaking to you at all, maybe you're here <clears throat> and you have been clinging to some other sort of treasure. Uh, you've been walking in disobedience. You've been... Uh, You've been going your own way and trying to buy your own gold. And, and, and maybe, maybe you just need to work things out with the Lord. We, the altar is here open for you to come and just say, Lord, I, I, I'm finding treasure in a whole bunch of other places and it's not satisfying me. And maybe you need to come here and you just need to say, Lord, uh, it's yours. It's yours. It's all yours. Whatever that looks like for you. If you're here and you'd like someone to pray with you. I'm down here. I'd love to pray with you, pray for you, pray over you. Pastor Dan is here. Pastor Chris is here. Pastor Jonathan is here. We would love to minister to you however you need. So as we sing, would you respond how the Spirit leads?